into the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 20. We've been working our way through the Ten Commandments. Tonight we come to number eight, Thou Shalt Not Steal. Uh, and we refresh our <coughs> memories with uh, this portion of Scripture that lays before us what God commands. So it's Exodus chapter 20 and the verses 1 to 21. And remember, we are listening to the word of God. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter. Thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Amen. May the Lord bless this reading of his word to our hearts this evening. God, as we find it in the New Testament, first of all, in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. We've recently been thinking of this chapter in our midweek Bible study. Let's read God's word. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. 
For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their Jews, tribute to whom tribute is due, <coughs> custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in, ch in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And then I ask you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read the first 12 verses. Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your satisfaction, that you should abstain from fornication that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour, not in the, the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. Amen. May God bless these readings from <coughs> his holy word. come this evening to consider this eighth commandment. <coughs> Thou shalt not steal. But what is stealing? Why should we not steal? How can we keep from stealing? These are important questions that we must try and answer. 
Imagine for a moment you've been out for the evening and you return late to your home to find the place in disarray. The television is missing and some other articles that were of great sentimental value to you, maybe not of much financial worth, but of great sentimental value, have been taken. How do you feel? It's really only when you have had that experience that you can relate to what feeling can do. Maybe it's your wallet that has gone missing and in it your credit cards and of course then you get that dreaded call from the bank. There have been certain drawings made on your account. You've been stolen from even though they've never been in your house. This eighth commandment is very short and very direct. Do not steal. And I'm sure you all agree. And if everybody was to obey that, wouldn't our world be a much pleasanter place to live in? Paul Earlier in his letter to the Romans says, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? Seems like a strange question to ask of those who would be teaching the commandments, men like myself. You wouldn't expect me to steal. And you see really what Paul is doing, he's, he's opening up the truth that it's not just lifting something that belongs to somebody else. There are so many ways to steal. For us to fail to do something that we ought to have done is to steal. So let's ask this first question. What is stealing? What is stealing? In its simplest description we can say it is taking something that belongs to somebody else. It's not yours to have. So you steal it. You take it from them. And there are many obvious ways to steal things. Shoplifting. You could rob a bank. You could break into some business and take the stuff that is in it, whether it be tools or products that were there for sale. But then there are other less obvious ways that we can steal. copying music on the internet or films and doing it without paying. That's a form of theft. It's one that the authorities have managed to greatly curtail uh, using certain uh, passwords and stuff on the internet. Another way to steal is to steal the credit for somebody else's work. We can steal through cheating, through defrauding, through misrepresenting, or through deceiving. Somebody sells you a car, <coughs> they have told you that it's a very good car, that is one careful lady owner, they all do by the way. 
It's in perfect condition until you get it home. And then you discover a lot of faults. You've been robbed. <laughs> and we would often say that. I was robbed in that thing. Somebody files an insurance claim. They've had a fire in their home, a minor fire, and there's been some damage done. But instead of just curtailing themselves to the actual items that were damaged, they go around their friends and they gather up a few other items that were damaged and they add those to the list to try and boost their claim a little bit. I hope I'm not giving you ideas, by the way. <laughs> the student who cheats on his or her exams is stealing something that they didn't really earn, and they take it. The mechanic who looks at your car and he sees there's a hole in the exhaust, but he tells you there's a hole in the cylinder head. <laughs> That's why it's making that funny noise and he charges you an arm and a leg to do something that only cost him a few pence. Fraud can take all sorts of forms. Relationships. Paul talked about taking advantage of others. He considered that sexually. But in our day, it's manifest in all sorts of ways, taking advantage of other people, with their kindness, with their, their virtue, and so on. In First Thessalonians 4 that we've just read, in verse 6, he says, Do not defraud a brother or sister. And that might apply to all kinds of relationships, like pretending to be a friend while you're really looking for a way to and get some benefit from that person. You're only befriending them for what you can get from them. And stealing isn't always about actually taking something. It's, it can also take the form of not giving what is owed. Not paying your bills. Or delaying payment longer than you should have. It can particularly apply to the government, holding back what we should be giving them, such as our taxes and so on. Uh, in that reading from Romans, Paul talks about paying our taxes or where those taxes are due. And we could apply stealing to employment as well. Leviticus 19 verse 13 says, Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. So if a man comes and works to you on a, a, a daily basis and he's expecting paid that evening, pay him. <coughs> Don't hold it back. Deuteronomy 24, verse 14, Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset, because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Moses says that holding back wages from helpless workers is stealing just as much as robbing them on their way home. Of course, employees steal from their employers. A story is told about a company who were negotiating with a union about the abuse of sick days. And the company negotiator held up a newspaper with a story about an employee who had won a golf tournament. Uh, and that was all very laudable, but except he had phoned in sick that day. 
So he had phoned in sick in order to go and play a golf tournament. And he asked the union man, what do you think about that? And the room was silent for a while until the, the union man said, well, now just imagine what he could have done if he had it been well. <laughs> Stealing from people is bad, but stealing from God is, is the worst of all. In Malachi 3, verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Uh, and that verse goes on, God uh, says, test me in this, bring me the whole tithe. And if you do, I will open the windows of heaven and I will pour out such blessing that your, your barns will not be able to contain it. And of course people argue, but that was Old Testament stuff. That doesn't apply to the New Testament. We're living in the day of grace. God doesn't intend for us uh, to give a tithe of what we earn. But the Lord Jesus Christ was very specific when he said that not one jot or one tittle passes from the law. He didn't come to destroy the law. It does apply to us. We are obligated by God to give to him at least one-tenth of what we earn. And that promise still applies that if we don't rob him that if we in faith give him the tenth he will bless us and he will give us far more than ever we have given away to him now that doesn't give you some sort of a formula whereby you can become a rich person but it simply gives you a formula whereby you can know the richness of God's blessing it may not be money he will give you back but he certainly will give you contentment in your soul and peace in your business. So that's what stealing is. But why should we not steal? Why should we not steal? Psalm 119 verse 66 says, Teach me knowledge and good judgment for I trust your commands. I trust your commands. God says in the commandment, do not steal. There's as good a reason as any for not stealing. Because God says so and we are trusting in him. The society that we live in in these days is a dishonest society. The standard of morality around us is deplorable. People see no problem in cheating and lying and stealing and many other things. For the majority of the people out there claiming benefits from the government is fair game. You're unemployed, you're getting unemployed benefit, but you go and you work at the same time. And they see no problem in that. As long as they can get away with it, why not? Whom do you trust? Do you trust the culture of the workplace? Do you trust the activities of the people around you? Are you going to look at that all and do what the world does? Or do you trust God? Thou shalt not steal. And whilst the temptation to steal may be very great, and the rewards may appear to be even greater. God is saying to us, if you don't steal, I will reward you. 
Now God's commandments aren't just for us as individuals. A person here, a person there. They're for all of society. It should be beholding upon our society that they keep these commandments of God. It's the only way that society can be fair and livable. Many of the poorest nations in the world are poor because of the abuse of their riches. Places like Manibia, where there are great reserves of precious diamonds. And yet those people in authority in places like that are so dishonest that they steal the proceeds and the country lives in abject poverty. A lot of talk in these days about Russia. A lot of us here this evening can remember when it was a communist state. And when it was trying to root out God and, and forbid that Bibles be allowed into the land and so on. And then overnight, Gorbachev did away with communism. But what happened? <coughs> Along came people like Putin and his oligarchs. And they monopolized all the riches of the land. They took control of them and they stole what they wanted for themselves. And so we have people who could come and buy football clubs and $500 million yachts and all the rest of it. Whilst in the land, the poor rank and file are basically just having a subsistence living. But it doesn't only apply to places like Russia and to Africa. It applies in our own land too. We see our politicians with no ethics, or at least very little. They've been elected to serve us but they use their position to serve themselves, taking backhanders and bribes in order to do favors for the rich and powerful, allowing big corporations to be able to escape their tax bills, for example, whilst we are expected to pay every last penny in ours. Of course, we can't control what other people do. But we do have to be able to get out the message of what integrity and honesty is really about. And one of the places we can do that is at the ballot box. We can be among those few people who obey God's commandment particularly with regards to honesty and uprightness. Some of you may have saw the movie, The Family Man. Nicholas Cage is standing in a line to get a cup of coffee. The girl in front of him is buying something that cost her 90 cents. She hands the cashier a dollar but the cashier gives her back $9.10. He makes a mistake. And she sees his mistake. But she silently puts the money in her pocket. The cashier realizes his mistake. But not wanting to make a scene, he looks her in the eye and he says, Is there anything else you need? She shakes her head and walks out. The cashier looks at the next man in the, lay, and in the line and he says, Did you see that? She was willing to sell her soul for $9. Now 
may not seem like much of an incident to us, but it, it speaks of the depths that people will stoop to to try and just gain that little bit extra. The psychologists conducted an experiment. Uh, they got a number of people to sit an exam. Uh, they were put in an empty room alone. There was no invigilator to oversee them and they were told that when the allotted time was up, an alarm would sound and they were all expected to immediately stop work. Uh, of course, when the time came, nobody had finished. The exam was designed to be like that. But when the alarm sounded, 71% of them kept on working, trying to finish the paper. They had put another group of participants in another room with the same restrictions. But this time they were set facing a mirror so they could see a reflection of themselves. And this time, whenever the alarm sounded, only 7% of them kept on working. How foolish do we need a mirror to remind us that what we do is actually seen? They were watching themselves. But what many people tend to forget is God is watching. These things that people do in order to try and boost their own position, their own wealth, and so on, all of these are being observed, not by CCTV, but by God. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. You cannot hide anything from him. Of course, those of us who take our stand for Christ, those of us who claim to be believers, we are also being watched. We are being watched by the unbelievers. They are just longing for an opportunity to be able to ridicule us. First Peter 2.12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. And something that we all do well to remember is that our children and our grandchildren are constantly watching us. They hear the things we say. <coughs> they see the things we do. And they mimic them. I'm smiling because on last Monday, my brother-in-law told me of his son. Some of you have met little James. And he's at school now. And James... Well, last Sabbath morning, he was going to church. His mother was trying to teach him his Sabbath school lessons, and he wasn't being very cooperative. The father took him out and put him into the car, and he turns around and says, the father, that's one stupid woman. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where he heard that before. <laughs> the children watch. They learn, they see, they pick up. We have a great duty of responsibility towards them. So number three, how can we avoid stealing? How can we avoid stealing? Jesus identifies the root of the cause. The root of dishonesty, the root of theft. In Matthew 15 verse 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, 
false testimony, slander. Evil thoughts cause theft. What sort of evil thoughts are we talking about? Well, for some people, it's a, a sense of entitlement. I'm due it, and if they won't give it to me, I'll take it some other road. My employer doesn't pay me enough, so therefore I'm justified in stealing some things from the workplace. The person who buys the car could have that attitude, I give them enough money and I'm going to try and get as much out of them as I can. So they start complaining about things that's supposedly wrong in the car that aren't really wrong at all. A 19-year-old shoplifter tried to justify her theft by saying, sometimes it feels like you've already paid for it in that expensive store. Their prices are so high so I think I'm justified in taking a wee bit to even up the bill. And sometimes people feel a bit like that as far as the government is concerned. This false sense of entitlement. That is very much the mindset of people in our society today, the omit. Greed. The sense of entitlement. I want more. More money, more success, more power. And at the center of it all is that evil thinking that the devil encourages within us. First Timothy 6 verse 8, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. What more do we need if we have food and clothing? We sit in front of our television screens, we watch the news, we see the situation in Ukraine, we watch dumbfounded as those people have left everything to flee for their lives. All that they have labored and worked for through their life and perhaps their families for years left behind, blown to bits, gone. Most of them will never see any of it ever again. Would they be justified in coming to a new land and stealing everything that they could get their hands on to try and get back what they had lost? Of course they wouldn't. But people do rationalize or try to rationalize their actions. They tell themselves, well, we're not really stealing. We're just borrowing it for a time or using it. Or we justify it by thinking, well, it's not really wrong. Everybody else does it. How can it be wrong? But those of us tonight who are trusting in the Lord are not to be like everybody else. We are to be holy. That means different. It means to be set apart. We are not to copy the word. Ephesians 4 verse 17 says, I tell you this and insist on it. That you must no longer live as unbelievers do in the futility of their thinking. Futile thoughts lead to futile actions. Mm -hmm. 
do the right thing. Live as God commands. What must we do to stop stealing? Again in Ephesians 4, this time verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. I'm sure all of us have had the experience of, you know, somebody owing you money. I know I've had that experience of, you know, selling people something and I've never been paid for it. And I, I know that in several instances I'm not going to get paid for the people have died. What about that? Would I be justified in really going over the top to get that money back? But the people, when they purchased the item, had every intention of paying it back. The circumstances dictated that they were unable to do so. Like the teacher who would take a sick day at the end of each term. And he wasn't sick, but he had put off marking the end of year exam papers until he actually had to take off a sick day to mark the exam papers. <laughs> Does the one thing justify the other? If the only way that we can maintain our current lifestyle is to cheat or rob or steal, then it's obvious what needs to be done. We need a change of lifestyle. We need to deal with the root cause, the idle thoughts, the desire for more. these things that drive us to do that which God forbids us to do. Thou shalt not steal. And keeping the commandment initially for some people is a real struggle. For me it has never really been a struggle. Somehow or other that has been ingrained in me not to steal and I'm sure many of you here are the same have we ever wanted because we refused to steal no we haven't because in resisting we have trusted God and God blesses those who trust him if we do that, if we obey his commands, then he will indeed bless us wonderfully. He will provide for our needs in ways that we never, ever imagined. And we will go to our beds at night and we will lay down our heads and we will sleep soundly because our consciences are clear. You know how it is when you notice that you have a bad tire in the car and it's not convenient to get it fixed and you're, you have to go on a journey and you're driving along the road with that bad tire and you're always hoping that there isn't a policeman stopping and checking. You're not really content until you get there or you get the tire fixed. We all sleep better when our consciences are clear because we know that we are right with God. Our conscience <coughs> isn't troubling us. And I believe that's one of the greater motivators for us to not steal. But in not doing so, 
We are saying no to the temptations of Satan. We are resisting his evil ploy. And we are trusting in God that he will provide. Let's all be like that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again we are reminded here of the duty that you have laid upon us in this commandment. You have made it clear that we are not to take anything that doesn't belong to us. No matter how we may feel that we can justify it, Lord, we know that there is never a good justification. You have given us these commands so that our society would be fair and just. And Lord, we pray that you will help us as your obedient children to keep them. And that in so doing, we will set an example to others around us that they in turn will keep them. And therefore, our society will become a better place. So Lord, help us in this. Help us to trust you. Help us to be obedient to you. Help us to love you above everything else. Help us, Lord, so that when we lay down this evening or any evening, we will know that we have been obedient and faithful to you. Give us that wonderful feeling of contentment, Lord, in that. Forgive us for the times when we fail. We know we are not perfect, Lord. We do often fail. And we pray for your patience with us as you continue to sanctify us and help us to be more and more the people you're asking us to be. Hear our prayer, for we offer it in Jesus' name. Amen.